Next up is Florian. Um, some time ago, um, there was a paper that explained how SRE training was automated because we needed to automate a lot of um, like classes, right? So it, it was very interesting to see the systems that were developed. So when I read uh, Florian's um, description of his talk and how he automated teaching automation in Python, um, it really piqued my interest, and I think it's going to be really interesting uh, to hear from Florian. So uh, thanks very much, Florian, once he has the mic set up. Automating teaching about automation in Python, which is probably the longest talk title I've ever come up with, but I couldn't resist. And I almost forgot to plug in my remote there. Let me fix that. So I'm Florian. I started programming in around 2006, mostly in QBasic, a very ancient uh, language from a DOS or Windows 95 times. And then switched to Python when I was working on an art project with a friend where we modified an electric typewriter to automatically write out tweets from Twitter. And there was a point where I really was at the limit with the languages I knew. So I tried Ruby for a weekend, which, by the way, has a very nice tutorial in form of a comic with foxes. I would recommend reading it just for the fun. Uh, then tried Python for a weekend. And, well, Python is basically my job now, so guess which one of both I liked most. Um, in 2013, I started developing Qt Browser, a web browser written in Python using the Chromium engine, um, focused on keyboard usage, focused on power users, and that turned into a part-time job for me, funded by donations. Via Qt Browser, I also got into PyTest, and as uh, those things go, I ended up being a core maintainer of PyTest at some point. Uh, also giving PyTest trainings to companies mostly, also trainings about Python best practices. So if you're interested in that, let's talk. And finally, I did my bachelor's studies in computer science at, it used to be called HSR when I finished, now it's the Eastern Switzerland University of Applied Sciences, which is probably longer than my talk title, or OST, which is shorter. And I ended up being employed here for part of my time. So the time I'm not doing open source or company trainings, I work here at OST and teach Python to first semester students. That's the company, Bruhin Software, but this talk will be about the teaching I do here. So until last year, students here learned Java and mostly only Java as their primary programming language in their studies. Now Java can be kind of a pain to deal with, especially if you really only want to get something done and make your life easier, rather than learn the kind of fundamentals of programming. Now, of course, both are important. But still, we had more and more places in the IT studies where Python is used as a tool to get something done, uh, as a kind of teaching tool for simulations, for examples, for things like math, physics, AI, but also projects, the final bachelor thesis. And more and more students started to demand they want to see Python in their studies. And actually, lots of other universities internationally have introduced Python or even switched completely from things like Java or maybe C++ to Python. And we had nothing until then. So last year, we introduced a new course, Automatisierung mit Python, for all first semester bachelor students here. In addition to the existing Java course, but with a different goal, kind of solving real-time problems and making students' lives easier. The official goal is students will be able to use the Python programming language for simple and complex automation tasks. The philosophy behind that module was maybe kind of an experiment, for at least for a first semester module, based on the flipped classroom uh, idea. So we have no lectures, or almost no lectures. We have no paper exams. As you might guess, students love writing code on paper in the exam session. They don't. 
but instead we have interactive graded labs and a small graded project. We also noticed we have many newcomers to the IT studies or people mostly doing maybe support or network or other IT uh, disciplines without much programming experience. And if you haven't done much programming before, the best way to learn programming as a craft is to get your hands dirty. And after all, there's a reason we are called the University of Applied Sciences. We want students to learn both theory, but also have actual programming practice. So I built up this course last year where there are interactive labs about various topics based on a Jupyter lab instance. I'll show you in a second about that. And after the theory, students have interactive exercises they solve as part of this Jupyter notebook. Now, they would like, of course, to have some feedback about where they stand with those exercises. And that's the point where things start to scale rather badly. Because I have uh, over 100 students, yet I'm a single person mostly doing this, with some help, of course. So what I did was writing automated tests for those exercises, where people can run a command in the Jupyter notebook and see an overview of where they stand, of how many test cases passed or failed, but without getting the full output of what exactly their problems were. Because if they did, then it would just be a game of who puts the most time in it, and everyone would have a very good mark, which on the one hand is nice, but on the other hand, we, there is kind of something we need to grade. So the idea is that there is one ungraded lab. That's actually what I started with yesterday and today. If you were wondering why 15 people suddenly started walking out after Dave Halter's talk, that's not about him or his talk. That, uh, those were my students just taking a look at the conference here. Because why not if there is a Python conference in the building over? Then there are five graded labs, which are a third of the final grade with those automated tests, and a final project they hand in, which are two-thirds of the final grade, but graded manually. More about that in a second. It covers things like just Python basics, flow control, data structures, writing a command line tool, and using web APIs. So really things which might be useful in your studies and your daily lives. So yeah, the problem was, as I kind of hinted at already, I had last year around 120 students with the help of some people, but still a, a lot of stuff uh, ended up on my plate. And that made out a total of nine slots, four hours each, every two weeks. This year it's a little bit less, it's only seven slots. But still, for me doing this the first time, uh, that was a lot. And thanks to my boss for believing that we could pull it off. I'm not sure if he's still in the audience. He is. <laughs> he's shaking his hat. But in addition to all that, I love writing open source, like Cube Browser and PyTest and giving company trainings. So I didn't want to give this up. So this kind of should stay a part-time occupation. And other people were busy too. Of course, I did get some help, but still it was... Quite a rush of adrenaline when I did this the first time. So with over 100 students, any kind of manual, tedious, boring work is almost certainly worth automating. If I'm teaching students how to make their studies easier, might as well make my job a little bit easier using automation. After all, why not focus on the interesting part? Of creating an environment to help people learn, on helping people who are stuck, and just the beauty of teaching. I like helping people. I like seeing people succeed. So I'd rather spend my time on that. And let Python do the boring part. Bonus points. I'm doing more or less the same module every year. So it, 
I hope I expect my work to get easier every year. However, a word of caution, automation, automation is not a complete um, substitute for teaching. You can take it too far if you, uh, at some point, your uh, students just call you lazy. And I've seen this happen before, where lecturers ask students to write exam questions for them. That doesn't really end well. Um, but still, I'd like to focus my attention on whatever benefits students most. Now, there's, of course, a danger when you automate things. You would think it starts with you writing code, then your automation takes over, and you have lots of free time because you don't have to work anymore. In reality, it might look a little bit different. You end up debugging your code. And just in the second I mentioned debugging, my remote dies. <laughs> nice timing. Oh, well. Then you need to rethink your approach. And suddenly, you're working on an open source project and have no time for what you actually intended to do. Back in 2013, when I started Qt Browser, I also thought, well, it would be an easy thing, an easy project. I didn't think I would still be working on it almost 10 years later. And I kind of did the same mistake here a little bit. It really reminded me of that when I saw um, Bittner's talk this morning. I thought, oh, well, I just need a handful of very simple scripts. Why should I bother setting up like a Python package, type annotations, linters, formatters, or tests? Oh, whoops, I'm a Python maintainer. Oh, well. So I started with a couple of scripts for like deploying the notebook files to the server, scraping participants, like uh, students in my course, more about that in a second, sending welcome mails to them, other automated mail sending. I continued, or we continued, with a project called Testing as a Service, where the tests actually run in a separate, isolated container so that students only get this kind of redacted information about the test cases. Then in the lectures, I figured out, well, it's kind of tedious when students ask me what actually went wrong because I need to go check the report uh, they submitted by hand. So I wrote a GUI tool which displays the test report and the notebook. Then I noticed, well, it would be nice to kind of get a feeling of where people stand, get an, an overview, so that's another script. Then some more utilities just for handling things. Then the final project came along, along last year, and I figured out, well, I might, might as well make the grading a little bit easier. That's another thousand lines of code. And finally, to rerun the tests for everyone locally in a parallelized way, because I might have improved things in the tests for everyone and, and such, and calculating the final grade, that's another thousand lines of code. So what I thought would be a couple of small, simple scripts ended up being 45 Python files. And there are six and a half thousand lines of code, or five thousand lines of code, uh, according to Tokai, which is a replacement for the CLOC count lines of code tools. That's not including the lab solutions and tests for the labs, which is another four thousand lines or so. Well, whoops. <laughs> but it turned out great. If I'm looking at the feedback I got, and that graphic actually tells a lot, because it compares the feedback people get at, at this uh, school at Ost in, in a whole. Then in green, the feedback IT people or IT students give, and in blue, the feedback for my course. You can see quite interesting things there. Like in average, IT students are in their lectures less than other students. But also, my students were in my lectures even less. Now, I'm hoping that's not because my lectures were bad or boring, but just because of the very flexible format, giving them a lot of freedom. 
But you can also see they found the contents important, they found it interesting, they found the materials useful. One of the very few things where I got a slightly negative score is it being understandable. And I did the mistake there of just teaching about things which I've used since I was a kid, things like command line interfaces, and just not thinking about the perspective of someone who is new to the topic. Just not considering that people might not know the convention of using double dashes for arguments or even what a command line argument is. And that's, uh, that's kind of hard when you teach things and something I hope I usually uh, catch when I do so, but at this point I didn't. And something I hope to improve, of course, for this year. People also said they had a lot of room for asking questions and they had a, lo a lot of um, opportunities for checking their progress with automated test cases. And overall, they were very happy with the course which I'm also very happy with, with this really being a first time thing and being an experiment. It was a successful experiment, I dare to say. So what did work out? I would say the concept of this kind of interactive learning, interactive teaching or flipped classroom as a whole was a very good idea. I recently was in a workshop of Daniel Procida or Evil DMP uh, behind the Diataxis framework which is uh, structuring your documentation into kind of those four quarters of tutorial, how-to, explanation, or reference. And one thing he said, um, which I found really inspiring, is I hardly believe in teaching anymore. The best thing you can do is creating an environment where people learn. On the more technical side, very early on, we decided to use Git as a kind of database for student submissions with one branch per student. This has worked out beautifully because then, if for example, people submit things after the deadline, you can easily look at the diff and see was this just like a typo change or was, was this something major. You can reset their branch to whatever was before the deadline, before you grade them. So that, that kind of uh, concept of using a Git repository felt very natural for what we are doing. It was a good idea to kind of archive test logs as well, even if they are, you could say, kind of build artifacts. We added them as HTML and as JSON to the Git commit, which made the tooling much more easier because we didn't need to rerun the tests, we just could display the results. And it paid off writing a custom GUI application to look at the test reports. As far as the grading goes, I decided to use Markdown uh, and have a markdown checklist which I fill and then parse from a script to calculate the grade and that has also worked out very well. And really all the other automation. Other than not setting things up properly early on, there's nothing I regret in there. Of course we had some issues. It started with, and I've never quite figured out how this happened, with students accidentally deleting the cell tags we said in Jupyter. So you can attach kind of meta information to a Jupyter cell, and we use that to pull out the source code to test. And sometimes that tag just was gone. And I've never quite figured out why. I think it's when people accidentally cut, press the cut button and then undo, and there was a bug in Jupyter which doesn't restore the cell tag. I think I've reported that and it was fixed by now. But I've also built some tooling around it to notify us. And I figured out that it's possible to protect cells in a Jupyter notebook so they can't be edited at least. And added that to my deployment script so that we can work with it in the development repository. But when we deploy it, everything gets protected. The GitLab admins of our uh, local GitLab instance here they did a storage migration without making it read-only first. They had a banner like, please don't use it today. But with all the tooling around that, nobody saw the banner. So I sent out the final grading emails. Thought, well, I'm almost done with this module. And then people started complaining. A lot of people started complaining like, 
But wait, it says I've never handed in those two labs, but I did. Then I checked my Git repository locally, and so yeah, the labs were there. So what went wrong? And after some debugging, I figured out, yeah, well, someone did the storage migration. All those commits were gone on the server. Thankfully, I had them locally and could restore things. But I've since asked them to please not do that again. Their response was, well, I didn't know anyone was using this in production, <laughs> more or less. <laughs> well, yeah, there we go. And just various smaller issues with the Jupyter uh, cluster. We ended up just giving people uh, deadline extensions there. After all, we are all humans. I ended up forgetting to check some checkboxes in the grading checklists. Human mistakes are just bound to happen with so many students. And thankfully, we caught that thanks to the feedback mails. But still, there was some place from additional sanity for additional sanity checks. And the API for the system where we, well, the API for the system where we hand in the grades is basically download an Excel file, fill out the grades in there, and upload the Excel file again. Of course, there's a Python library to deal with Excel files. One of them, at least, is OpenPixel. But somehow, it ended up corrupting the file. I've never quite figured out why, but I ended up just copying the whole column in, uh, and pasting it in LibreOffice, and then it worked. On the more human side, there are some things I've discovered nobody really can prepare you for. Now, as a disclaimer, I don't, call, I don't like calling out students for their mistakes. I think it's normal uh, to make mistakes, and students are allowed to do so. But those occurrences are just too strange to not tell you about. This happened a lot. Then something I can only describe in German as Allgemeine Verpaltheitsfaktor. In English, that would be maybe the, the general dreaminess factor or something. For example, the one student which was in the military for weeks and just didn't know they had to hand in something. Oh, well. That was one gem I found in the project submission. <laughs> and it's not like they didn't learn how to parse JSON data. And that was one thing where even the students couldn't tell me how it happened. I'm guessing they pasted something from, from their password manager. And they were quite surprised when I was sending them their password in their in Teams. <laughs> because at that point, it was compromised anyways. So with over 100 students, if, I, if there's one thing I've learned, you'll see every corner case you can think of, and some you would have never have thought of. Automation won't help you. You will need to take difficult decisions in those cases. Now to wrap up, I'll show you a couple of examples of things I've automated. So before the semester, I really like having a list of all students in my module. And there's a web interface we have for that, which also gives you the timetable and such. And there's even an email button there giving you a list of all emails. Now, my problem is um, I have like a different, uh, different kind of, um, of blocks I do, those um, seven or something blocks in total. So I, do, I need to do this seven times and copy paste and reformat things. But still, it seems silly to automate this, right? If you look at how many times you shave off the task and how often you do the task, then across five years, there's a certain time you can spend on automating. Here, I saved maybe five minutes, but I only have new stu students once a year, so I can only spend 25 minutes at automating this, right? Well, that's what I thought too last year, so I did it manually. This year, I learned from last year, people get added to your course last minute, even after you send out your welcome mails, even after the semester started, for whatever reason. People leave in the middle semester, and nobody cares telling you about things like that. So I ended up scraping the, this website. There is no API for the student data, as far as I know. 
I discovered there's like 200 kilobytes of JSON sent with every page load. Now I'm not wondering why this loads so slow anymore. But not the data I actually needed. So I ended up parsing the HTML. Now the problem is it's kind of a weird Microsoft OAuth or whatever based login flow. And there are like several libraries from Microsoft, but mainly tailored around um, API access. I didn't, I wasn't able to figure it out and thought, well, whatever, I'm writing a browser with a Python library, so I might as well just do the login, maybe with a bit, little bit of JavaScript and then grab the session cookie. It works out beautifully. Then during the semester, I wrote this um, tool here, where at the bottom, I have a list of all passed or failed tests. At the left, I have the Jupyter notebook with the code they handled in. And at the right, I have the PyTest HTML output with the test failures. And then I can just select the test at the bottom, and it will jump to the right place, both in the notebook and in the test report. On the right, I also see all Git commits of the student, so I can see earlier submissions, and it checks them out and displays those instead. And at the bottom, I have some shortcuts to jump to different labs or different students easily. I also wrote some command line tools, one to get a kind of overview of all submissions and who has handed them in, and also who has kind of which grade, if you were to grade them as they are right now. I've discovered it would be nice to see if someone has a certain mistake or certain error, if others have the same problem as well. So I wrote a kind of grab tool, which either searches through the test reports or displays the outcome of a given test for all students. I wrote a tool to see the kind of project summary for uh, the students, so which files they submitted, and some basic auto detection, which um, additional features they selected. They only have to do two of those um, nine or 10. And one thing I learned there is explicit is better than implicit. Next time I will tell them to please show me which features they would like to have graded because some people decided to do like more than two features, but didn't bother to tell me which of those um, to grade. And then for grading the project. This started with picking a random student I wanted to grade, getting their project submissions and unpacking it, showing an overview, so for example, which files there are just so I can get a feeling of, of how the structure of their project is, prepare a checklist for grading, opening it in the editor, then waiting until I close the editor, and finally parsing the checklist, um, parsing the points a student gets out of it, waiting for confirmation, and committing that grading file. And one thing I decided, is to only show student names as rot 13, which means you, well, you could call it an encryption scheme. And this is the only time I would advise using it in production, um, where letters are just shifted by 13 um, places in the alphabet. So you can just do it again to get the original text back. So my name would, for example, turn in Sibifna Uehuva which was there to make sure I do, I do not um, unconsciously kind of introduce some kind of bias while grading, because I don't know who submitted this project. But still, if there is something strange, if I need to reach out to the student for some reason, or, or if something goes wrong, I have an easy way from the logs to tell which student this was. Now that's how the checklist would look like. It's a simple markdown file with checkboxes. And at the end, I parse this and send out automated mails to people with their grades. Now that's still a lot of manual work. I find, I find out that I'm averaging 
seven projects per day, so this still took me three work weeks. But it was worth it. Tests can only go so far. Nothing will replace kind of human evaluation or a kind of um, common sense while grading things. At the end of the semester, I'm rerunning all test cases parallelized on my machine and calculating the final grade using the fractions module of Python, which means I'm only dealing with kind of weighted fractions and not introducing any rounding. And so far, there has been no case where a mark of a student really is in between of two marks, so I would have to round some way or another. So I got zero discussions about, but my grade was rounded somehow, because no grade was rounded. So what's up next? Well, since yesterday, I'm teaching another around 100 students, and I'm, well, not very looking forward to grading another 100 students in January, but that's what it is. On the more technical side, I would really like to turn this into a proper Python package, add type annotations and auto-formatting to it. I've already done that for the most part, run black over everything, and it looks much better now. Add tests for all the logic, or at least the logic dealing with kind of sensitive things like grading, and perhaps using a Python library for all the Git operations I do instead of doing subprocess. Because at some point, with I think it was 22,000 commits in the submission repo at the end of the semester, because people did submit their things a lot, uh, at some point it started to be kind of a little bit slow uh, doing it with subprocesses. And maybe at some point in the future, it would be cool to kind of generalize and release this so other people can benefit from it as well. That was all I have. If you are confused about f-strings, shameless plug, I run f-string.help, which is a kind of short overview about uh, of how f-strings work. I'm on Twitter as the compiler, and you can see my company website at bruin.software or reach me at florian at bruin.software. Thank you very much. <laughs>